So section 1.6 is properties of real numbers. Um, and we are going to start right in on with a definition. The definition we're talking about first is the term, is the phrase like terms. Terms are considered like terms if they have the same structure. Um, by that I mean the same variable with the same exponent. So x and y are not like terms, but neither are x and x squared. Okay? They have to match both the letter that's being used and the exponent if there is one on that letter. So when we're looking for things that can combine, we're looking for things that already are alike. So for this one, number one, the 5D and the 2D are like terms because they both have D and the exponent, whether you recognize it or think about it this way or not, on the D is the exponent one, they match. So when that happens, we can actually combine those terms together. And what is 5D plus 2D? 7D, 7D exactly. So now on number two, we see some terms that are y and some terms that are y squared. So y and y squared are not alike, okay? So you cannot combine y squared and y and make it y cubed or something like that. We're, we're just combining, right, adding things together. They have to be really, really alike. So these two are alike because they're both y squared, but the other term is not. So I can combine the two that I've underlined. What is 3y squared plus 2y squared? 5y squared. Yes. And then the other piece, the y, is simply added on to the end, plus y. Okay, does that remind you of the things you've been doing in the past a little bit more recent than fractions? Yeah. So that's, that's some algebra stuff, right? Um, and as we're moving in, we're going to see our next slide um, starts talking about, we have seven different properties of real numbers. And um, some of them you use a lot. Some of them you use more than you realize it. You don't even think about the fact that you're using them. So the first one is the commutative property. So the commutative property says that if you have A plus B, then it equals B plus A. And not only can you do it with addition, you can do it with multiplication. So A times B equals B times A. And I believe we've sort of mentioned that, or I've mentioned that in passing as well, is that it's really nice when you get to the end of your multiplication tables, your addition tables, and you're learning them because you've already learned most of them. And the order of switching doesn't change it. Okay, so the order doesn't matter for addition and multiplication of real numbers. The associative property is one that you use, the, the community property is one you use all the time and you never think about it. I mean, never in your life at this point does someone say, what's five times six? And you have to say in your head, okay, five times six, well, that's the same as six times five. I know six times five, and then you do it. Like, we don't think about using it at all, and we use it all the time. The associative property is much the same. It tells us that if I have addition, the order that I add things in is irrelevant. So if I have A plus, B plus C, that's the same as A plus B, and I add the A and B first, and then I add the C second. And again, not only does it work with addition, it also works with multiplication. So if A times B times C, that's the same as A times B times C. So there are just flat out some numbers that are easier to add together than others, right? Uh, for example, four and six add together really nicely. Why? Because they are equal to 10. Making things in equal to 10 is, is often very friendly, whereas making you know four plus seven and then adding something else after it to it is not quite as friendly. So sometimes changing the order of addition or even the order of multiplication is friendlier and we are allowed to do that. The additive identity and the multiplicative identity are the next two. The additive identity says there exists the number zero, right? Such that A 
a plus 0 equals 0 plus a is equal to a. You could add 0 to something and it doesn't change it. Um, likewise, there is a multiplication factor. So there exists the number 1 such that a times 1 is equal to 1 times a is equal to a. Um, we've been using the multiplicative identity recently. Uh, we didn't identify it quite that way. Um, but every time in fractions when you were finding a common denominator or a least common denominator and you multiplied the top and the bottom by the same value, right? You multiplied by 2 on top and 2 on bottom. Well, 2 over 2 is 1. You were really multiplying that fraction by 1. We used the multiplicative identity last class periods, okay? So we use that one quite frequently. Um, we also have, while well, these kind of come in pairs, the additive identity, the multiplicative identity, we also have the additive inverse and the multiplicative inverse. So the additive inverse says for all values a, there exists a negative a such that a plus negative a or negative a plus a is equal to zero. And we haven't done anything with this particular property in class yet, but we will, and I know you have before. Because when you solve equations, actually we did do it, because we did it um, in section, uh, I think it was maybe at the end of 1.5 where we were solving for a variable and we were moving things beside this. We, so we did do that. I've forgotten about that part of it. Um, and so when you're adding a value on each side of an equation or you're subtracting a value on each side of the equation in order to, to move something, you're using the additive inverse property. You're trying to shift it. You're trying to move it. And that's what this is allowing. The additive, I'm sorry, the multiplicative inverse is quite similar. It says for all a as long as it's not zero, it doesn't work for zero. But for all a not equal to zero, there exists one over a, the reciprocal. We've talked about that recently, right? The reciprocal. Such that a times one over a or one over a times a equals 1. When I multiply the number and its reciprocal together, I get back the number 1. We even talked about it being multiplicative inverse properties when we talked about it back in section, I think it was 1, 3. So we've seen this property before. I think um, number seven is the one that you sort of cognitively are more aware of every time you use it than the rest. You use a lot of those other properties that I just said, but you don't think about them as you use them. Um, they sort of feel very natural. We don't really even think about the names for them, and sometimes maybe you even get the names reversed for some of them. But number seven, every time you do it, probably you're aware of it. It's a distributive property. So it combines multiplication and addition or multiplication and subtraction. And it says if I have a times b plus c, this is equal to a times b plus a times c. And not only does it work for positives, it works for negatives. So I'm going to go back and change my plus to plus or minus. And sometimes people like to draw these sort of arrows so that you're sort of drawing them in or shifting that a value through the parentheses visually. Um, it is kind of valuable at least to be aware that it doesn't matter whether the a comes before the addition and subtraction or after it. So if instead this had been written as b plus or minus c like this with the a at the end, I could still draw those lines um, or curves, whatever, and I could still multiply through and I would still get the same thing. So it doesn't matter if it occurs before or after the addition or subtraction.
Okay. So am I right? Is distributive property the one that you sort of think about more when you use it? I know I do. I mean, I, I don't ever think about the commutative property except when I tell you guys about it. Um, maybe when I'm working with one of my kids with flashcards or something, um, I might think about it. But the distributive property, every time I do it, I think about it. I mean, like I, not because I think it's hard, but we just are sort of aware that it's there. Um, and we use it a lot. We actually do. And we're going to see us using it a lot in the examples um, today that we have. So we're going to do some examples together um, and make sure that everybody's on the same track. Now, problem number one kind of looks like it might have distribution, but it isn't. Remember, distribution means that inside the parentheses, there's addition or subtraction. Does it not look like that on your paper? They're the same, but numbers are just different. The numbers are different? I number three and not number one. Really? Yeah. yeah. Because here's my book, and it starts with number one. Oh, like the problem number says three. Oh, it sure does. Oh, I know why. I was trying to make it more smooth so that all my numbers went in order, and I already did examples one and two, but I forgot to change it on my slides. I'm with you. So this is actually examples three. I'll change my slides later. Four, five, six, seven, eight. And nine. Yeah, I'll get those adjusted later. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know that. I would not have even noticed it. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so the, the part that there is parentheses here, I mean, or there are parentheses here, um, but they do not have addition or subtraction in them. They don't. The number that's inside the parentheses is just the number negative two. That's all it is. So on this one, I have the B, and that's fine, but really the numbers that I'm able to combine and actually do something with, or the values, are the four and the negative two. So if you sort of think about it, you don't necessarily have to write this every time, but you're actually doing the associative property and the commutative property as you shift things around and think about it without thinking about it. I would actually do this and I would say, okay, well, what I'm really doing is I'm multiplying four times negative two, right? That's negative eight. I'm going out of order, but I'm allowed to go out of order because it's multiplication. I'm allowed to do that. And then I have that negative eight times the B. Okay, so I'm using the properties. I'm using the associative and commutative property on this problem as I shift things around and combine them in a way that actually simplifies what's there. Now on number, uh, what do we have, number four. On number four, it actually really is a distributive property, right? Because I do actually have addition or subtraction, in this case subtraction inside the parentheses. So as I distribute that three through, what will I end up with? Right, good. Now, five is also distribution. I just have the multiplication at the end instead of the beginning. But remember, I talked about that back on number seven over here as being a viable option. It can be written that way, it's no problem. And I will simply distribute it through as such. So I have four times six, which is and then I have the negative 2a times 6, right, negative 8a. And then I have the 3b times 4, 12b. There's no simplification. None of those are actually like terms. One of them is a constant, doesn't have a variable. And then one has a and one has b. Okay, any questions about that one? All right, so you see on number 6 that you do, in fact, have a fraction going on here. We talked about fractions for a couple of days now, right? So as we're working on this one, we're still using that distribution property, but now I actually have to do 12 times 2 thirds. So I need to do 12 over 1 times 2 over 3. We'll simplify that in a moment. And then what's 12 times 2u? Uh, 24u. Mm -hmm, 24u, right. All right, so the 12 times, or 12 over 1 times 2 over 3, we can either multiply across top and bottom, or we can simplify before we do the multiplication, um, either way. Okay, so um, Maxwell saying that he would like to take the 12 and the three and divide them both by three, is that right? I agree. We can do that, make that a one and this one a four. So it leaves me with four times two, which is eight. So now this is eight plus 24 U. All right. Yeah. 
Any questions on that one? A little messier with the fraction. Um, we multiplied the 4 here by the 2 here. And Haley, if you don't want to do it that way, you can actually multiply across. You'd have 24 time, or 12 times 2 on top, which would be 24, and 3 on bottom, and then 24 divided by 3 would also be 8. So you could also do it from that perspective. The numbers actually stay pretty small either way on this one. Yeah. Any other questions on that one? Okay. All right. Just a few more. Oh, did I skip one? I did. There we go. Number seven. Okay, so on this one, um, what do you see? A little bit more going on. Distribution, distribution and then... We got the subtraction after that, right? Okay, so we're gonna do the distribution first, like you guys said. So we'll distribute that three through. What will that give me? Three y plus 18, good. And then I still have the negative y or minus y at the end. Then what can I do? Yeah, I can combine this negative y at the end and this three right here, which will give me what? Two y plus my 18. Okay, make sense? Okay, so it's two steps on that one. More steps on eight. <laughs> All right, so on number eight, it says uh, we've got two sets of distributions, right? Yeah. So go ahead, let's divide, or not divide, distribute the four through, and we'll distribute our two through as our first steps. So what's the first piece of distribution going to give me? Good, 4k minus 28. How about the second set? Right, and I'm actually distributing through a positive 2, so I get positive 12, and then I'm going to get negative 2k. So be careful with the sign in between here. If this sign had been negative, I would want to distribute it all the way through as well and make sure that it affects all my values, but it was positive. Now what? I combine like terms. I have a 4k and I have a negative 2k. That's 2K. And then I have negative 28 and positive 12, negative 16. And then those two don't combine. Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay, our last example for today doesn't have any parentheses at all. It still has a lot going on. So what do you know here that you could combine? Okay, fabulous. So those two have x squared in them, so they are like terms. And what would I get if I combine those two? 4x squared. Okay, what else? Okay, I've got the negative x and I've got the negative 3x. They're both negative. Right, negative 4x, and now you'll see again why we hit on those integers back in section 1, 2, right? We use integers and the subtraction of negatives things all the time. Um, and then what do we have? Right, and then we have a 2 and we have a negative 7, which gives us negative 5. Any questions on that one? Okay. Yes, Haley. So on our, when we're doing our uh, homework, are we going to be cut off? Like, if we don't do it in the same order, like we did 4x squared? No. And in fact, I knew there was something as you guys were saying it that I wanted to say, and that was exactly what it was. Um, let's say, for instance, you had done this, but maybe you had gotten, I, this would be a natural way to write this one based on the way it was ordered originally, um, and you write it like this instead. That's totally fine. The order does not matter. Okay. Not at all. Any other questions? All right.